just a small mea culpa. If, there, if you heard any buzzing on that last panel, that was me. My phone was going off in my pocket. Um, created a little feedback issue, but I don't think it was that noticeable. Um, so let's talk about money. Um, specifically, uh, AI and how the A AI's impact on the financial industry, wealth management, banking. Um, another industry, that, like all industries, I mean, this, this entire conference, we're going down the line. We're going to talk about agriculture soon. Um, and they're just fascinating developments in all of these industries. Um, but everyone is unique, and everyone has different opportunities. And having spoken with the three of you at length, like, I think we're going to hear some of those innovations uh, from each of you. Oh, OK. Let's do this. Um, <laughs> so let's start. Gil, I want to talk with, I want to start with you. Uh, you know, as the chief innovation officer at Deutsche Bank, um, how, are you, how are you using AI? You've had a, a, making a lot of noise about how you're deploying AI and your AI plans. What, what does it mean, and, and what are your priorities? Sure. So uh, pleasure to join everybody here. Um, I guess there's, a, I would highlight three things. First of all is that I think this is the first time that we're seeing a, a technology shift being driven by businesses. Uh, so we're, we're seeing our leadership um, moving forward with this as opposed to technology coming in and saying, here are a set of tools. Uh, we've seen it uh, uh, driven by our CEO, by our management board, and moreover, our our supervisory board is, is pushing forward on it. So I think that's a big change for us. Second thing that has been uh, really important for us is the uh, change in the regulatory environment. Uh, and I would say that uh, um, two years ago, you would have gone to the regulator and any black box would have been a non-starter. I think there's a move from a black box to a glass box right now. So there's a, a whole context about observability of maybe not knowing anything, everything that is happening within the box. But if I could understand what's going in and what's coming out, maybe that's a good enough um, um, framework and controls to move forward. I think that's a really important for us, a really important thing. And the last thing that we'll talk about is the uh, uh, transformation of empowering the individual uh, business uh, uh, employee or the tech employee of these capabilities with natural language. So if up to now we've been like looking at coding as the, the foundations, uh, we're now going into English as a programming language and the context around that is, is a profound one and the capabilities that it's enabling and we'll probably you know talk about how you know chat box and and everything around those are going to become an ecosystem and we talked about what open ai is doing starting to put those co-pilots those duet those elements into it and then triggering off work streams is going to uh, have a profound impact Again, doing that with natural language, without programming. And again, those are the three topics for us. Um, again, business being involved, regulatory environment, and then the, uh, I would say, democratization of these power to a lot more people. I love that idea of English as a programming language. I mean, it's, it's so clearly what we are doing when we are prompting. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating idea. Uh, John, uh, can you talk a little bit about how Google AI is working in the in the banking and in the finance space? Absolutely, and I mean, I would say you know Gil's point as he started was a great one. Is that this is one of those technology that is being business driven versus technology driven. Typically, in the past, you know, coming through technology, you're trying to convince the business to adopt. In this case, in my role, I'm seeing a lot of the cases. The conversations are with the business. How are we pushing um, technology to move faster, quicker? You know, I think that a lot of the places where financial services start is you end up with people, then you have process, then you have technology that, just, that comes in and you build that to justify the people in the process. Now it's people coming in saying, okay, what is the technology? How am I going to leverage generative AI? What is the process or in this case, the risk parameters I need around it? And then what are the remaining people that I need to run this process going forward? So when you think about where we're working with people, it's everything from as you think about operations. 
operations in banks has not changed a lot in the past 20 years. It's still a lot of paper. It's still manual contact centers. You call into a contact center today, it's a very similar experience to what it was 20 years ago. So it's everything from chatbots. You know, I can talk about something public. If you, Wells Fargo, they have their Fargo chatbot. That's po powered by Dialogflow, a natural language chatbot, interacting, answering customer questions, being able to drive them to the next best action. When you think about areas around risk, any money laundering, KYC, we're using a lot of this empowering banks models to run across that. And then just thinking about how do you, growing the top line, your data, your analytics, how do you get to a deeper personalization? So those are areas and a lot of others that we're working with banks today. Nicole, how are, uh, how are entrepreneurs and smaller businesses using these new generation of tools to generate these efficiencies and, and just operate their businesses? In my work at Milken, I mean, we are a think tank, we're a nonpartisan think tank that's focused on finance, philanthropy, and health. And in my work, we focus on the end user. What is the value to the end user in terms of these new technologies, innovation? How are they growing their businesses? How is it growing the economy? I would say entrepreneurs are some of the most under-resourced, undercapitalized, isolated creators in our society. And AI is a game changer, because we're moving from an information age to an innovation age to now an intelligence age. And entrepreneurs, when you say, I, I need an agent, an assistant, an advisor, they say, sign me up. They're looking for all of the above. They need branding. They need customer acquisition. They need, they need compliance. Um, they need research and development. Um, they need dynamic data to be input into their business models and into their systems. And so AI is that game changer for entrepreneurs. It's going to be the, the next level of intelligence. And in this intelligence economy, um, entrepreneurs can also build intelligence assets. Um, intelligence can become an asset by taking all the best practices, all the knowledge and know-how, and inputting it into a system that can, be work, that can work as a playbook. I'll give you an example. I'm in an Uber car, and my driver is a retired accountant who has advised companies for over 40 years. But he's driving an Uber because he just wants to get out and hang out. All of that intelligence, and not the proprietary intelligence that he gathered from his clients, but the intelligence that that Uber driver has for 40-year experience, as an accountant, as an advisor, um, working on mergers and acquisition deals, all of that information, um, as we're now in an inflation, inflationary market, when, when there was a past inflationary market, what kind of advice could that Uber driver give to the current entrepreneur of our day? That is the, that is the hope and the promise of AI, and that turns us into a dynamic um, space where intelligence is really driving real world advantages. And that's something that I think entrepreneurs as we deploy AI and we give them the tools to understand how to build on AI, that's a use that I definitely see happening. So Gil, we talked a little bit, I mean, it sounds similar to the, the, the business analyst briefings that um, you've been, that you work on at Deutsche Bank. Can you talk a little bit about how those come to be, how you're using them and how they're, how they're created? Sure, so we, uh, we have a research team. Uh, every bank has a research team that does uh, macro research on economies and obviously on, on specific stocks. Uh, but if you think about that a concept of what an, uh, a research analyst does, basically he needs to gather a lot of information, synthesize it, summarize it from a lot of sources, uh, 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 add some specific data that you have from proprietary data that is yours, and then basically present some kind of a, of a document to, you know, in some cases the audience is your, your clients, in some cases, it's uh, an account manager or a sales executive that is going to a meeting uh, with a client. And we basically looked at all of that and uh, um, created uh, a very clear view of how we, we work around that, uh, with, which basically has three components into it. One is summarization, and the, the key element is to be, be very, very precise that when somebody is working with summarizations, there's clear citations, there's all of the grounding that needs to happen in order to know that what, you're, you, what you have there is accurate. Uh, then you have a, a different, um, I would say, module that is the Q&A on that, the, the, the going back and forth, and you can also invite other people to join. So it's not only you and that uh, specific chatbot, 
And the last uh, one is obviously brainstorming. When you do want to a bit of hallucinate, you want that creativity to happen. So we have very clear um, you know, interfaces also to uh, enable that. And then out of that comes various templates because you may have a specific style that one of our analysts writes in or a specific template um, and you want it to be consistent. You don't want to just do a copy paste and then work because you want to automate all of that. Uh, you may have your standard uh, executive briefing or client briefing uh, format or things that people would prefer. So we've, we've created all of that. What we found is that right now, uh, in most cases, we're actually not getting a good enough results with the large language models to, to satisfy us. We're continuing to work on, to, on improving it. Uh, and then uh, we're seeing, uh, we're starting to see good enough results. The problem is the price point is now too expensive. So at the beginning, we didn't get the good results. Uh, when we're moving over to the, to the more advanced uh, models, we're seeing good enough results, but again, the price point is not there. So we're in between these, these two points of, you know, the technology is there, the price point will come down, and we need to start thinking about there's a whole orchestration layer above the large language models of how RAG architecture and, and elements of how do you now, you know, manage it in order to get the right results at the right time, uh, uh, you know, speed as well as cost. And last but not least also, it was mentioned before ESG, we're also very conscious of the ESG elements. Cool, so one of the things, uh, John, you talked about operations and banks not having evolved um, in a long time, and we talked a little bit about call centers, mm -hmm. how they operate, and just and actually the cost of operating a call center and, and how banks look at that as a cost center. Um, maybe talk a little bit about how AI is already being used to bring those costs down and hopefully make for a better consumer experience, but definitely bring costs down. Yeah, I mean, I think all of us here have called in one, you know, whether we wanted to or not and talked to a contact center at a financial service institution. And again, it hasn't changed. It is a situation that banks looked at those as cost centers, historically underinvested in, right? So it's very much of a everything from entry level people coming in. It's not people typically on the phones looking at his career. Secondarily, the resources that they have. It's a lot of swivel chair. I'm moving to this system, to this system, and you sit there on hold. So the stat you and I talked about, my past career they used to look at um, the bank I was at one second of handle time was the equivalent of a million dollars on an annualized basis. And when you sit there and think about that, so much of that, if you listen to calls, and there's a lot of them in my career, it's painful. It's just all of this hold time while they look for information. So when you think about going to something that Gil was talking about, summarization, that is an easy, you know, when you first, before even going something customer facing, We've taken what Google has when we think about Google search, and we've got a product, we think about enterprise search. So how do you first search your knowledge base, thinking just in terms of your own internal policies and procedures, because that's what they're usually looking for, and how do you feed it back in a way that they're able to see the answer, citation is key, because they need to be able to link back to the document they have, but provide that in a quicker, faster way. You want that to improve the customer experience, as well as reduce cost. Because if you think about where we are in the economic cycle right now, you know, over the past couple of years, we've talked about wage inflation, but that hasn't been, as it has been historically, the white collar wage inflation over the past couple of years. It's been a lot of the blue collar wage inflation, particularly in the context centers of people who didn't come back post um, COVID. People used to sit there and say, okay, well, it's a decent customer experience. I'm paying 15 to $20 an hour it is. Now I've got friends who run these centers and they're saying, I'm paying 40, 50, 60, $70 an hour for people and I can't find them. So we're looking at every way to search. How do you sit there and use chat bots and build those into the applications using natural language? So people never need to call in in the first place. So there's a tremendous ability for people to take out a, a large amount of cost as well as improve the customer experience. And that's why if you look across the board, most of the large financial institutions are one way or another. It's the first place they're starting. I would, I would just say that I predict that probably 80% of the people here on, in, in this room in a year from now will use transcription in all of their um, Zoom, uh, Google Meet, uh, Teams, and um, that transcription is in essence 
something that you then real time could ask what, when, when, I, when was I mentioned any action items? Can you summarize this for me? Can you, so that technology is here today and it's just a matter of, of it will become a standard um, everyday productivity capability that everybody will be, will be doing on a daily basis. And there's an opportunity for the banking industry, the financial services in industry, to expand the kinds of services it can provide with AI. I mean, 35% of Americans worked with a financial advisor last year. That means 65% were not connected to a financial advisor, did not get any financial advice. And so to the, to the extent that bank banking system, financial services can provide that type of information to educate and inform the masses on our financial wellness, which society, we do not have financial wellness. We're not in a place where people feel confident about their finances. They feel anxious about the ability to go out and grow their businesses and get, get capital and access. We need to connect the banking institutions, the financial institutions, to real people so they can grow their businesses and they can thrive. And so where is that disconnect? Where do we have all of this technology and then we're missing the opportunity for the application of the technology and the real world opportunity to leverage on it? I think the, the, the idea that, I mean, that's an amazing figure. I'm actually surprised that 35% of Americans, Americans, Americans. Um, have used a financial advisor in the last year. That, that seems high to me, no? But it, I mean, still. Or, or, or worked with. Work Did with. they take the advice? I don't know. There's that. <laughs> There's that. But the, um, I mean, it is. It's a huge unaddressed market um, that all of the, the banking industry could take advantage of. Let me, it's, I mean, it sounds like a very positive story. And I, I take your point about transcription. Most of my pre-calls for this conference were done. Exactly. Otter AI was on the line exactly. and creating transcriptions. And I would go through that. And that's how I prepared the questions. Um, and it was invaluable. And a year from now, to be able to search through that year's worth of dialogues and, and, and history is going to be really amazing. Um, do you, Nicole, let me ask, do you have any concerns? Like, these are big companies, Deutsche Bank, uh, Google, you know, are smaller, are, are smaller banks and smaller uh, companies going to be able to take advantage of these tools? Like, do you really think it's going to be enabling? I do. I hope so. I mean, this, this is the time to do it. The, the opportunities here, the applications are here, the intellectual capital that we all have to, to deploy is here, and it's hopefully it'll take the smaller guys and bring them up so they can leverage this to, you know, advance their businesses, use this data, um, find opportunities in markets that they're unable to, to find right now with their own searches. I mean, that you can have an agent, an AI agent or assistant searching the markets for you for opportunity, connecting new customers, that's an opportunity that I think small businesses are always gonna, gonna need to leverage and grow. And one key thing that you know, Nicole brought up earlier when you're sitting there talking about, look, it's the entry, the barrier to entry is lower on this than it was before. So you have some of the smaller players who are going to be more nimble. They're not hire, having to hire these tens of thousands of, or you know, not, tens, of, tens and twenties and a hundred developers to do this. They can develop things much quicker and much faster with their ability to compete. Because when you sit there and talk about, you know, third, whether it's 35%, 25%, whatever it is, but how do you sit there and give hyper-personalized um, experience to people from a wealth management standpoint? And how do you come down that cost curve? Because now maybe your wealth advisors can serve a greater number of people. AI is not taking the job. So in using AI might take your job, but how are you making that wealth advisor be able to um, go farther down the cost curve and be able to experience more because they're able to use tools to be more productive. So we've talked a lot about cost controls, lowering costs. Gil, if you look down the road in terms of new things and um, really expanding and really embracing the potential of the technology, you know, where do you see financial, AI-driven financial services in five or ten years? Well, there, I, I think we need to um, crack one, one very important thing that uh, I think will unleash a lot of productivity. But there is the, what we talked about is the transcription. It provides um, improvement of a 5% to somebody. From an enterprise perspective, it, th those are the most compelling and the most difficult use cases to actually quantify. Because you do understand, everybody understands that it provides uh, improved efficiency, productivity to, to everybody. But then, from a CFO perspective, all he sees is additional cost and no return. Now, at a high level, if the market, if your respective market is growing, 
then you're in a sweet spot because you now can help with the productivity. And you're saying, OK, I'm, I'm providing now tools, and my people can do a lot more uh, with the same. Uh, if you're now in a shrinking market, that you're trying to do the same with less people, then you're in a very uh, interesting predicament. And I think that AI could play both as an accelerator, it could also be uh, um, um, a driver for cost efficiencies. And on the cost efficiency side, if we are unable to figure out a, a mechanism to enable that CFO to uh, quantify that, uh, we're going to have a slowdown, at least in some large enterprises, with the adoption of these technologies, which means that then the consumer will drive it, and it will get to the, or, uh, to the enterprise in the back door uh, in, a, in a bit of a delay. So that's one of the areas that I think, if, if you think about them, it's more, most impactful, but it's very, very challenging from a CFO perspective. It's a great conversation. Thank you guys so much. Let's give them a round of applause.